everybody it is it is long hair it is scruffy day it's glasses day who's in the chat how's everybody doing oh my gosh and the camera's turning me red oh my gosh it's a crazy day every once in a while the filter like changes on the camera i have no idea what's going on but with that we are going to do some review for stat 201 with review three right here one of my favorite song everyone loves the favorite song there we go review three we're going to talk about notation i think that's a good spot to start stat to a one test three notation for the test let's go check it out where's mubot review three mubot let's go check it out mubot oh he said it <gasps> no hello blake um you bots thing got eaten he said it there might be something new on youtube because i see where mute bot is said it in the there we go okay that's weird well there that appeared now so there's the review right there we do a little notation to start right here uh here we go here's all the things for the third test look at this we've got the formula sheet hey Maria, good to see you here if you got questions let us know i can do the notation here to start um basically i want to go over what this notation means because a lot of people have questions on it like what in the world is all this notation what is going on here and so with all the questions it's important to know what the notation is good morning Lindsay. if you have questions let us know okay so let's start at the very beginning it's a very good place to start and when to use the formulas yeah so let's start with the one sample t-test okay or the one sample test <laughs> so we've got two different one sample tests we're going to start with everything right here we'll take another screenshot of this now one sample proportions let's make a note of the video we call it one sample proportions one sample proportion test one sample proportion test. three one sample. what does one sample mean chapter yeah we could do some of those do some homework you bet the homework after this you got it what does one sample mean like when it says one sample test we should know uh so one sided deals with confidence intervals good good answers right there we gotta throw some points out here so the sidedness or excuse me one sided deals with hypothesis testing when you talk about it can be right tail it can be left tail or it can be two tailed that's the sidedness of a test. So those are the sidedness. So one sample is different though. Got to throw out some points. One sample is different than sided. So a one-sided test are like the less than or the greater than. There's a greater than test, greater than, less than, and this is the two-tailed. So that's one-tailed, one-tailed, two-tailed. But what does one sample mean? What does one sample mean, which is different than one-sided? So when you talk about one sample, the one sample means you're going to a group, a whole group, like one sample. So does that make sense? Like you have one sample, like I talk to UT students, I talk to um, Tennesseans, I talk to kind of univariate, I guess it would be univariate, I'm trying to think of univariate means one variable but one sample means there's one sample like you have one group you're interested in understanding compare this with the two sample test which we were doing last class and if you go down here to the two sample tests what do you have right here like what is this called if you know the notation right here that'll help that's the mean for what and that's the mean for what like if you look at what i'm highlighting right here in the two sample test what do you have right there that'll help you with the notation you have the mean for sample one and the mean for sample two so there's two samples that you're going to compare in a two sample test so the two sample test has two groups does that make sense why it's called a two sample like you could compare ut and florida students where up here in a one sample test you might just look at the mean of ut students and compare it to a hypothetical value so this is not a second sample that mu naught we'll go over that more in depth 
but understanding what one sample means it just means you have UT students, you have Tennesseans, you have uh, people who take test three. It's one sample. But if we were to compare two classes to each other, like class A versus class B, we'd have two samples, a sample from class A and a sample from class B, and we'd use a two sample test to compare the difference between the samples. So one sample means there's one group you are testing. The sidedness of a test goes to the way we do the what. When we say sided and we say something like it's one-sided, two-sided, what are we talking about? The sign of the what? The sidedness of a test, not sample. So this is where people you get confused here. So like freshman would be one sample of a freshman and sophomore. Exactly. If we if we just look at freshmen, that'd be a one sample test. If we compare freshmen to sophomores, that's a two sample test. Like if you say, let's compare the sample of freshmen to the sample of sophomores, that's a two sample test where you're comparing the two samples. If you say, let's look at the freshman against a historic value from last year's freshman, that would actually be a one sample test because you're still just looking at one sample of freshmen. You can use a historic value to compare them, but that's not a sample. It's like, let's, you're not doing a second sample. You're just saying, here's a value we want to test our sample against. Does that make sense for you? And so one sample is how many groups you've collected on. We're only collecting one group right here. And then sided tells us the what of the what. The sidedness tells us the what of the what. These are things to importantly know when you say like it's one-sided, two-sided, that tells you the what of the what. I'm highlighting things with colors to let you see the sidedness, one-sided, two-sided, tells you the what of the what. Very important to know this like, oh, when we're talking sidedness, we're talking the what of the what. That'll instantly tell you the what of the what, like a greater than, less than direction of the sign for the what hypothesis. Direction of the sign for the alternative hypothesis, exactly. When you write out a null hypothesis, the null has the equal sign. And depending on which way your sidedness of your test goes, like that's the two-sided, you would have this right here. So this would be P equals P naught. And you can see P naught using the notation and P naught equal P naught. The important thing to know is that the sidedness of the test is decided by the alternative hypothesis sign right here, which is right here. So let's go over all this notation right here. We're going to do all the notation, then we'll do some homework. So that is the difference between sidedness. Let me remark the video right here because we went over a different topic than this test right here. And that portion was stat 201 test three, sided, one-sided versus one sample. Okay. So now we need to know the one sample proportions. So the first thing, help me with this notation. If you know all this notation, you're doing well. How is the class? Oh, uh, let's take, we'll take a look at that after this. Yeah, I'll, we'll do that in the break right here. So now a confidence interval. Let's start here with P hat. P hat is the center of the interval, which is our best guess. And what is P hat in notation? What is P hat in notation? Let's put down everything we know about P hat. So when we're solving a problem, we could find P hat. What is P hat in notation? Like, what does it mean? What's P hat in notation? I'm typing it, so it's really pretty. It is X over N. That is true. What does it mean, though? It, oh, great job, Lindsay, right there. Lindsay's got the, it all, and great job, Blake. It is the sample proportion proportion uh, found by X over N. So what is X? What is X? So what is X now? Now we need to know what X is. So sometimes you're given this and we'll write an example right here. For example, 25% of UT was born in Knoxville. Something like that, or we'll go 15%. Probably that more accurate. Number of successes. So this is number of successes that we have in our sample. For example, uh, 100 or let's go 75 of 500 students were born in TN or born in Knoxville. And so if you take a look right here, what we have is this is X. So show me how you get P hat from this. Show me how you get P hat. Really easy in the chat, but once again, we're just reminding ourselves how to do all this. How do we get P hat from this example right here? Uh, number of successes in a sample. 
There we go. 75 over 500 equals P hat. So you can see right there, X over N. So I made the mathematics work, I think. It should be, great job, Blake, right there. And P hat is often expressed as a decimal. So we could put right here 0 0.15 like that. And that is often how we express P hat, but it could be expressed as a percentage. So that is P hat right there. N is not lower, uppercase N, but lowercase N is sample size. Uh, for example, we sampled 500 students. And now we have here the Z star. The Z star means what? And why does it have a star? So, uh, you know, I wouldn't say cumulatively. I'd go over the exam review pages that we're doing right now. Why does Z have a star on it? Why does Z here have a star? Now be careful. These are not the same thing. These two values right here are not the same thing. Those are not the same thing. This Z, it's related to a level of confidence. So this, diff, this Z right here, this Z with a star right here is the Z score relative to percent confidence. So 95% uh, is 1.96. This is given on the test. So we will give you these on the test. That Z star right there is relative to the percent confidence. So it's not the same as that Z you see below. And then we should know everything after the plus or minus is called the what? Everything after the plus or minus is called the what? Very important to know this too, because that's all the what? That's all the margin of error. Now, usually right when we find P hat, we find what? If you find P hat, you're gonna usually instantaneously find what? And great job everyone here practicing Roshni and Ria, great job. As soon as you find P hat, you'll find what next? You'll find Q hat. How do we find Q hat? So how do we find Q hat? Let's go over here. How do we get Q hat? Q hat is found how? One minus P hat, great job. So we go right here, oops, can I do it? Do it. There we go. Q hat. Uh, do we misspell proportion? Proportion. Sure. And this is sam sample complement with an e uh, found by, and we usually just do one minus. Let me put P hat in here. For example, if P hat, for example, uh, 0.85. 1 minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.85 right there. So when you said Z is given on a test, you mean like 1.96? Correct. We'd give you the Z for the confidence interval. That is correct. The Z star. So the Z star is given. Um, but what else do you know about Z star is the more confident you are, the bigger Z gets. So you do have to know a little bit of theory about it, that Z is relative to percent confidence. It's the percent of area we shade in the curve. So let me go over here real quick and show it on the David M. Lane that if you get more confident, because we're trying to make sure everyone understands all about these equations, if you get more confident, you shade more of the curve, such as if we go from 90 to 91 to 92, 93, 94, 95, there's the 1.96, 96, 97, 98, 99, 99, and we keep going and Z keeps getting bigger and bigger and we shade more of the curve. If you do something like an 80% confidence roll, you only shade the middle 80%. So the bigger Z gets, the more confidence you get and more of the curve you shade. So the more uh, values are contained in the interval. Um, I think that basically does it for this. Uh, the only thing to really know right here is the standard error, not too much on it, is found by the quantity right here, which will be used in the equation. And the standard error is basically an estimate of variation within your sample. Uh, we don't go too theoretical on that, but the standard error is p hat times q hat over n square root. How do we spot what type of problem to use this on? So how would, and this is a really great question, how would a, a question that you're using this on here look like? Really great question, Blake. Blake, let's throw you some points for that. How would it, can anyone write it in the chat right now? Because um, I could write you a question right now using this. Give me the start of a question that would use this. So try to think of how the start of a question would be that would use this. If you can start thinking about how this would be used, then you got to construct a 95% confidence roll. And what do you want to estimate with your interval? That's you're on the right track with that. Construct a 95% confidence roll and then, but go into more detail because there's other 95% confidence rolls. Where what? 
well, that's the interpretation. I am blank percent confident that the true blank is containing the interval blank to blank. And so, but what do you want to make an interval for? You are on the right track. Construct a 95% confidence rule to estimate the true what? So construct a 95% confidence rule to estimate the true what? Not the true mean for this one though. Not the true mean. Good. That's why I'm reviewing this right here. And that's why I'm pausing. Um, mm -hmm. So the true proportion you see, and then you've got these hints right here, right? Cause that's the sample proportion. And these are the things I want you to see when we're practicing right here and be like, oh, it says proportion right there. Construct a 95% comps rule to see the percentage of UK students that were born in Knoxville. There you go right there, Lindsay, great job. Uh-huh. And so this question right here, we've kind of alluded to it with, you know, what we're doing. Um, and great job, Lindsay and Blake and Roshni, good practice. So when you see that this says proportion right here, you'll know that you're using the sample portion to estimate the true proportion right there. So there's lots of little hints when you practice reading the formula sheet to see what we're doing. So it, it even says proportions right there. This has nothing to do with means because we'll go to means here in a second, we would see the T. So the next thing we see is the Z sub P hat. I wonder if I can make that exist right here. Okay, Z sub p hat sure we'll do it like that okay so there's the z sub p hat i usually just call it the z score and this is the standardized difference we use to find a p value so this z right here are these two not that one are these two values the same yes or no are those two values the same, yes or no? Are those two values I've highlighted right there the same value? Will you like plug one in, the other, and what up, Wes? Um, no, those are not the same. The Z from the test is the difference between your sample and your null. This is the difference standardized right here. Those are very different value. The Z up here is based on the percent confident you are. So when you say I'm 90% confident, you pick a Z-score related to that. Nice job. And so now those are different Z-scores. And what do we use this Z-score right here for? This Z-score right here is used to find what? What do we use that Z-score for? 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 This z-score right here is used to do what? There's a lot of review right here. We use that z-score, which would technically be right here. What up, Evan? We use it for hypothesis testing. And then we use the z-score to find the what? The z-score will be used to find the what value. What is the z-score going to be used for? We use it, not the alpha, the, the p-value, the p-value. So we use it to find the p-value. And so what is the sidedness of the test? Is this a greater than, less than, or does not equal to test? We'll show this here again. We'll show an example of doing this. It is a greater than. So if my Z score, if this Z sub P hat right here is equal to 1.2, find me the P value right now. Find me the P value. Who can go to the applet real quick and find me the P value? I'll go do it here in a second, but I can tell you it's going to be very close to about 0.11, maybe 0.114. That's my guess. My guess is 0 0.114. So you take the z-score right there, you go over to the applet, and you go to a greater than test. You make sure you're on the z-score curve, and then you enter in the z-score of, oh, not the area, we're on the wrong side of it. Sorry, you got to go over here. And you go to above. Oh, really? I was that close, Rhea? There we go. I was just, I was just a thousandth, uh, um, 1100, 11, 10,000s off. 
So Rhea, great job there. Some points, Rhea. So very close. Um, been doing this a lot, so <laughs> know a lot of these. And so the p-value is the percent of area to the right in this instance, because we're doing a greater than test decided by the way the question was worded. So that is how we use the z right there to find the p-value. Next, we see right here p naught. Now, a lot of people don't know what p naught is. What is p naught? What is p naught? Who knows what p naught is? Great job right there, Rhea. So it's the hypothesized. So it's whatever they want to test against, and they're saying this is true. So it's the hypothesized true proportion. So in a question, it might say something like, let's say, um, so it could say, we want to know if more students are coming to UT than previous years, the registrar, reports that 20% or 15%, uh, we use that for 12% of Knoxville comes from, go, goes is, goes to UT. We, this year we see 15% from a sample 200. Is this evidence the percent of students has increased? So what is P naught in this problem? What is P naught in this problem? Great job, Evan, right there, writing out the null hypothesis. That is correct because Evan found P naught in the problem. P naught is going to be the hypothesized right here, what we're saying could be true. And then from a sample, we see P hat. And then this is the sample size right here. Now there's no X in this problem. Does anyone for a thousand points know what X is? Does anyone know what X is in this problem? Which you don't need to find. X is not required, but if you want to back work it for X, you could find X. It's the number of successes in the sample. So it's not required. You wouldn't need it to solve, but if you're just trying to be thorough, you would maybe know what X is. Uh, that is going to be the, that actually right there is the test for successes and failures, Rhea. Um, that would, uh, so not 75, say 30, 30. How could you check 30 to see 30 is the number of successes? How could you check 30 to see 30 is X? Now you don't have to do this. It's not required, but how could you check 30? And Evan's showing the math. Great job, Evan, right there. That's how Evan got it. And how could you double check that number? How could you double check 30 to make sure it's the real amount of successes in the sample and be like, okay, that is correct. X over N. 30 over 200 and you should get 15%. And so that will confirm. Now that's not required, but it's just good to understand the notation. Um, we could run this really quickly because the mathematics for this are going to be P hat minus P naught over P naught Q naught over N. See if you can solve this with me. Once you know the notation, it's simply just plugging in the numbers. So P hat was 15% minus 12% over Make sure this is P naught on the bottom and that's over 200. We might get about a Z score about 1.2 again about, um, and hopefully someone else does it to make sure I don't make a mistake. Oh, we're going to get about 1.6 or something. Do I have freeze waffles or syrup? Ah, uh, do some frozen waffles. I love some waffles. I'm all about, I had some French toast sticks this morning, 1.3. And so now we go ahead. Ooh, yeah. Here, let's do Evan. We'll take a vote in the chat. So waffles, cereal. You gotta, you gotta go by the vote here, Evan. You gotta go by the vote. And so it lands about there at one point three. We go over to the David M Lane, and our picture is gonna look something like this. And the Z score is, or the p value is gonna be something about uh, zero point nine oh nine. One, two. No, it's going to be six. 0 0.096, I'm saying. And so we take our thing here, copy it. There it is, 0 0.096. Uh, there we go. 
So I like waffles is winning out. So does everyone understand this test we just did? And this would not be evidence at the 0.05 alpha level. So an alpha is where you reject the null. Since the p-value is higher than alpha, we fail to reject the null. We do not have evidence or alternative. Isn't it everyone in A and sucks? Oh no. So yeah, we're gonna do some chapter 17 coming up here in a moment. Maybe we'll just do this portion right here because I'm hoping there's really not too much else to say about this because we just did the test and we should know Q naught. How do you get Q naught? Which I just found Q naught. So we actually just did a version of the test. How would you find Q naught? So how in the world would we get Q naught for this problem? Yep. Complement of P naught. So one minus P naught. So we just found it a moment ago. It's just if right here in this problem, in the problem below, it is one minus 1.2 equals 0 0.88. So we found it like that. Good stuff, good, good stuff. So this is the one sample proportion right here. Maybe we should have done the two sample T. Uh, also, I have videos going over this. Yeah, this and this is what you need to know. You need to know what all this notation means right here, when to use it with proportions, when to do a test. And we did an example test down here below. But knowing the notation is key to solving these. Let's do some homework. Okay, I'm back. Let's put on chill music. Uh, there was questions over the homework. I like this. I haven't shaved in like a week. Some people won't shave for one day and they look like this. Not one week. Got some gray in my beard. Let's go check out the homework. My contacts, I really, I might even get new contacts because my contacts are bugging me. I got bifocal contacts because I'm old. Um, chapter 17 quiz about a man. Is it the man doing the bike? Good to see you, Ken. Um, is it the one, the bike routes? Yeah, the new, there it is. Roshni puts the two cities, um, the two city bike route one. Do you know where our stash product grades will be released? Should be a week. Should be a week. They have a week to grade things. So one week. Is it only on the quiz or is it on the homework too? And that one's a notation one. The two routes. So it's really good. It's good notation review. The two routes one is a notation, notation, notation. Notation, brother. Notation review. Let's see if we can find out on the homework the two routes question. That one is all notation. Okay, I'm gonna find over here. The homework. It's on the homework. What number on the homework? What number on the homework? Question eight. Yep, found it. Thank you so much. I was like, let's do question eight. Okay, so what do we need to do for this problem? What do we need to do for this problem? This question is all about what? Well, let me put it down here. 29 force. All right. Chapter 17 quiz. A man moves. Okay. Let's go check it out. Here we go. Student to correct. Oh, we'll do one here next. You got it. The drinking size one. So this question, how are we going to solve this question right here? How are we going to solve this question? I need your help and I need your understanding on how we're going to solve this. How in the world are we possibly going to solve that question about a man who moves to two cities? How are we going to do that? Any thoughts on it? Thoughts on this question. Use math. <laughs> we will use math. But we need to know the what. We have to know the what for this. We are going to need to know the what. The notation. Notation, brother. Okay. A man who moves to a new city sees that there are two routes. 
So he has what here? Use the wording from the notation sheet. He has what? He sees there are two routes. So he has what? Look at the notation sheet and see a word to say he's going to take two what's here. He's going to take two what's. So this would help you to know where to go on a notation sheet. I know I got glasses today. Two samples. He's going to have two samples. He's going to have a sample from route A and a sample from route B. He's going to have two samples. So this is a two sample test right here. Where he has two routes and neighbor both tells him longer that route A will average longer than five minutes. The man decides to experiment. He flips a coin to determine. So he randomizes the trials, driving each route 15 days. Driving each route 15 days is the what for each route. Driving each route 15 days is the what for each route. So it's actually the same for both of those. Driving each route 15 days is the what for both of the routes. Not the average, good guess right there, not the average. He drives them each 15 days, the sample size. So that's the amount of samples he takes. Great job, Christina and everyone practicing right here. The sample size for each route. He founds that, finds that route A has an average of 43 minutes. So that is what in notation. This is really good practice right here. He finds that route A has a 43 minute average. So what is that in notation down below? What is that in notation down below? Y bar one. Yep. And the bar means uh the bar means the mean of variable Y uh for sample one. So the Y variable of interest, how long it takes, and the mean being uh the bar, that's what bar means, and one being the first sample route A. Now, actually, we do have a bit of a problem here because they're setting it up this way. This I forgot almost forgot how they do this problem. If you look right here, they're saying the second mean is A. Does that make sense? So be very careful right there. You have to subtract it that way to get the interval correct. So 43 will go in that position because they're doing uh, B minus A. A lot of things use reverse alphabetical for some reason, It's just the way programs do it. And so we're gonna have to do it that way. So what does that make the average for route B? It makes it this one right here. And so we've got those marked. We need a lot of color here. And now, what is this value equal to right here? Be very careful. That's for sample one, which is B. What is the standard deviation of route B? What is the standard deviation is five. Uh, no, 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 that one is two. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's weird because it's reversed. Technically, if you get these reversed, it won't matter so much um, because you're dividing by the same number. So that won't create an error. And that one is five, because this is the route sample two related to route A right there. And the only last thing to find, which is the hardest thing for people to find, is the T statistic. Now, what chapter? Chapter 17. We need the T degrees of freedom calculator. The T degrees of freedom calculator. So what are the degrees of freedom for the one sample T? What are the degrees of freedom for the one sample T? Does anyone know the degrees of freedom for a one sample T? What are the degree? I'm not asking about the two yet. What are the degrees of freedom for the one sample T? The degrees of freedom for the one sample T is what? Correct. And the degrees of freedom for the two sample T the degrees of freedom for the two sample T is the following formula. Do you think we'll have you solve this on the test? This is the degrees of freedom for the two sample T, the formula to solve for it. No, you will not solve this on the test. So instead, look at what we have in the equation. Sample size one, sample size two. Standard deviation one, standard deviation two. Does that make sense? So you have the sample size one, sample size two, standard deviation one, standard deviation two. And if you look over here, we have the same things we're entering in. And guess what? There's the degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom for the two sample T are a complicated formula we will not solve by hand. So, <laughs> oh yeah, Justin. Oh, we'll give you some more points here in a moment. But this, this is the degrees of freedom for the two sample T, and we will not solve this by hand. We will instead use calculators like this to tell us the degrees of freedom. Now, what does the degrees of freedom tell us? 
what do what does the degrees of freedom tell us? Uh, right here, Roshni. Aria, oh, sorry, Ria. Um, so what does the degrees of freedom tell us? What does the degrees of freedom tell us? The degrees of freedom tells us the what of the what. The degrees of freedom tells us the what of the what. The degrees of freedom tell us the what of the what. What does the degrees of freedom tell us? Uh, not the direction of the sign. I'm showing it right now. The shape of the T, the shape of the T. So the more degrees of freedom, the more normal it is. The less degrees of freedom, the more it's smashed down, the less freedom Mr. T gives it to be normal. So the degrees of freedom determine the shape of the T. Um, this says, did say 95% confidence? It says we need to construct a 95% confidence interval and thus we have to put the degrees of freedom here and you could go to the between and put in 95 or the outside was showing it. So it's 2.101. That is the T-score. Your value will probably be close to what? Your value will probably be close to what? Since it's 95, your value will probably be close to what for the T-score? Like not exactly, but close-ish to what? Now be careful. If you get off by decimals, these are ones where I don't get points back because you have to be very exact with these. Um, so you might not get your points back on this chapter if you're off by a few decimals. So I'm like, no, I'm sorry, you gotta use the right T. But your T is probably, cause 68, 95, it's probably gonna be close to what? Your T score is probably gonna be close to what? Your T score for the 95% confidence is probably gonna be close to what? If you get close to this for the correct T score, you it's probably close to what? Close-ish to what? Two, because 68.95. Uh, 2.5 probably is a lot higher than it's going to be. Probably pretty close to two standard error, standard deviations. Because to right there, Lindsay, because 68.95, 95% comp stroll is 1.96 for Z-scores. But this is the T-score, which is more smashed down. So the T-score right here is the hardest thing to find. Uh, please review that again if you need where we went through and found the t-score we had to find the degrees of freedom first after finding the degrees of freedom we put it into the t-applet and then find the correct t-score so from here it is simply plugging in the numbers so let's plug in the numbers right here that we have the mean for route b the mean for route b is 45 what is your best guess of the difference between how long these routes take so how do you know? Oh, it would be plus or minus, so negative, positive. Mm -hmm. So you, it, as Rock would say. It doesn't matter! What is your best guess of the difference between how long these routes take? Does anyone have a guess for how long the difference is? Like, the difference is probably about what between the routes? Because this is your estimate over here. What would you say? What would be your estimate of the difference? Did you have to... Probably about two minutes. Yeah. Do you have to fill in the p-value to find... Uh, yes. Where it says p-value, that's just the percent of area on the curve you're shading. And you want to do between and do 95. Because then it's a 95% constant. Make sure it's between. And so you want the between right here. And make sure it's showing 95. And that way you have the confidence normal. Um, so probably about two minute difference, but let's make the plus or minus great job. We're right there. So five times five is 25 divided by 15. Two times two is four divided by 15 plus the value square root. That is now the standard error right there. Times the T score is the margin of error 2.92. So T. 2.92 there it is right there so we go back over here and the upper is going to be 4.92 and the lower is going to be negative 0.92 i should have all of it correct Woo! Woo! so it's just two there's the margin of error two plus this two minus this there it is right there um how do we get 2.92 uh, plug in all the numbers right here. And once again, so you have to solve this portion right over here, which is the standard error. Five times five is 25 divided by 15. So I just solved this. I'm copying that now and I'm doing two times two divided by 15 plus that value right there. 
So that's 1.9 right there. Everything under the radical is that. Now I'm square rooting, so it's currently this value right here. And then I'm timesing by 2.101 right there. Um, and then that value is the margin of error. So that's two plus or minus, which is the margin of error right there. Um, how does the interpretation go? I am 95% confident that route B takes anywhere from 4.92 minutes longer to negative to route A takes 0.92 minutes longer. So the true difference between the routes in average time they take is contained in the interval 4.92. So if we use our interpretation, Justin, I am 95% confident that the true difference in how long these routes take is contained in the interval 4.92 to negative 0.92, where route B may take up to 4.92 minutes longer and route A may take up to 0.92 minutes longer. Woo! But you know what's important about this, which they don't even get into this problem? What's contained in that interval, which means there's maybe no difference in the routes, which is a good thing. Good to see you here, Caden. What is contained in that interval, which maybe means there's no difference between the routes? So look at that interval, which they don't even mention down here. But what do you notice? Zero. Great job, Caden, jumping in. Caden, let's throw Caden some 10,000 points. Jumping in and answer that question right away. Um, so zero is contained in the interval, which means maybe there's no difference between the routes. And I wish they went into that, but they don't. Uh, they ask, is the claim of five minutes believable? And it's not because no, because the interval, because the confidence interval for the difference does not contain five minutes. So yeah, we wouldn't believe five minutes. We would believe maybe there's no difference. So really good question right there. Uh, pretty tough one, pretty tricky one, but it's all about the notation. I think the next one was it the glass one. Which one do people want to do next? Okay, so it's the true difference between the means. And we, those are harder ones. Yeah, like I am 95% confident the true difference between the mean amount of time these routes take is contained in the interval blank to blank. Um, so true difference between mean amount of time the routes take. Good question. Really tough one too. But it's all about notation to solve this. Which one should we should we just do number nine next? People were asking about this. Uh, should we just do number nine? A student took a random sample. I think someone asked about this one next. Researchers investigate drinking size. Is that on the homework? Which one is that, uh, Rhea, right there? All right, let's do nine ten because I think people asked about this one. Then we'll do nine ten. So. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. People asked about this one. There we go. Okay, let's check it out. And then we'll do glass one next here. So what do they give us to start right here? What do they give us to start? This one's actually not that bad. What do they give us to start? Like, they give us all the what? Do they give us the degrees of freedom? What? They give us the degrees of freedom? Well, look at that. How nice of them. So the degrees of freedom can be used to find the shape of the T. So we have all of our what now? We have every bit of our what now? We have all of our what right here. And how are they doing it? Are they doing large minus small? Which way are they doing the intervals? I wish they told if it was large. Too easy, right? All the notation. Notation, brother. So they gave us all the notation. And so we should be able to just plug in. So we have to know our notation. And we have the sample sizes here. We'll mark it right here. I wish we just wrote this as y bar one minus y bar two plus or minus. And that's the difference we estimate. And t star degree of freedom, and then square root s sub one squared is n sub one plus s sub two squared. Is n sub two. Okay, so now ban this. No, we're not banning this question. <laughs> um, so sample size one. I think they want a positive difference. Oh wait. For the mean additional amount. Okay, they want the additional amount, so they want the positive difference. Okay, so they say the mean additional. There's where it's telling me which way to do the differences. Okay, so it'll be the larger mean will be here. The smaller mean will be here because it wants the additional amount. The sample size for this one is here. The sample size for this one is here. 
And now we have to do the standard deviations correctly. So standard deviation, I like a lighter blue than that. Standard deviation for sample size one is here. This is gonna help me. Um, oh no, Justin, that's all right. Will the test tell us which, uh, yeah, we, we make it clear. It's more clear like, and our questions are actually, I think simpler than these a lot of times. So like, I really think if you know how to do the my Pearson problems, you're better than even the test because you have to understand the theory behind these. Um, yeah, I think the test is very, very clear. We go easier on it, but remember you get multiple attempts on my Pearson. So if you ace the my Pearson, um, no, you'd only get one attempt on the test. So we have to take the degrees of freedom and bring it where now we have to take the degrees of freedom because we'd have to give the TDU on the test. We have to take the degrees of freedom and go where with it. I can tell you this T value is going to be about equal to 2.35 about the T applet. So let's take 124.59 and go here and go 124.59 and go to 98% confidence. And it's 2.357, 2.357. Does that make sense how I got that? Oh yeah, it's pretty tough, right, Caden? 2.357, I didn't know the last number right there, but 2.357. So you have to take this right here. Justin's doing a great job right there. Nice job, Justin. Let's throw Justin some crazy points. Keep it up, Justin, good practice. So now we're just gonna take all the numbers and plug in all the numbers. Oh my gosh. I'm not gonna write this down. I'm gonna solve it out right here. Okay, so I'm gonna, oh my gosh. This, the only reason I would ban this question is it's just got way too many decimals, okay. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna start solving this out. Plug in your numbers, be very careful. You make a math error, everything goes wrong. Okay, I'm solving this over here currently. You make a math error, everything goes wrong. I would do this in R normally, because that's that. I just solved this value. Now I'm gonna solve the other one. So nine, two, the color coding is really helping me solve. Divide by its sample size plus the other value, square root. That is now the standard error. I know it does me too. And then what am I gonna do with this value? Multiply it by what? What am I gonna do with this value now? Seems rather small, eh, it's a pretty large sample size. No, I'm worried about, I might even recheck this. That seems small to me. Seems small. Let me check this. So, maybe it is because it's square rooted. Yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Blake. We're going to multiply it by the T score of 2.357. Uh, and I've just found the what now? 124. I've just found the what? I have just found the what? I have just, I just multiplied it by the T, so I just found the what? I'm showing it to you visually. I've just found the what? Two letters, all you got to type in the chat. I've just found the what of this interval. What did I just find? The, the ME, the margin of error. That is the margin of error right there. So I'm going to type 124. Oh my gosh. That is the margin of error. Now the difference is the difference between the two means. So larger mean minus smaller mean. Ninety-five thousand. There we go. And then we have to do plus or minus. So here we'll go over here. Twenty-four oh two. Okay. And guts it. Gosh, I'm worried. Let 
No, come on. Don't don't take forever. Round to the nearest. Oh, no, no. It says round to the nearest whole number. It says round to the nearest whole number. We're going to get it wrong because this is round to the nearest whole number. And it's going to take... What's it doing? It says round to the nearest whole number. Now, if you did that on this problem, you would I you could send me back for the points right here. Round to the nearest whole number is needed. And it's going to crash on me for some reason. The whole thing's crashing. No, so it says round to the nearest whole number. Please make sure to round. So it should be 94. 94. It's going to tell us we're wrong. Uh, 94939 and 95187. It says round to the nearest whole number and literally it's crashing right now. So nice. Some chocolate cover parts. Why? Literally? Wow. Are we still online? Can anyone still see me? Yep. We got the T upload right here. Make sure to round these. I didn't round these. Oh, everyone's dropping the T in the chat. Oh my gosh, people can still see and hear me. It's gonna tell me I'm wrong if it comes back. I would give you your points back on this because this isn't like a decimal, like it's not like, it all depends. I, I look at each one on its own merit. If you're like, hey, Brian, I didn't run the answers. That's what I don't care about. It, I wonder if anyone else is crashing. So I know I was like, oh no, I forgot to look at the rounding. And of course it crashes, so you can't even, I didn't get it wrong. So nine, four, if we reload the quiz, it's going to change the numbers. Just tell me I'm wrong, my Pearson. Really? We got time for one more here. These are tough problems. They they take a good bit of work. They're not simple solves. They're not simple. Well, give it five seconds. Four, four, three, two, one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it really wants you to know. It's like we'll let you. Uh, we'll let you look at this. I had to redo mine, got the first part right. Yeah, the big numbers are not fun. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can redo this one here real quick with, I'll show you the easy way to do it. We'll do it on easy mode here. Is it gonna reload now? So what I would do if I was solving this is I would go over here and I wish I could put the picture in here. Maybe there's a way. Okay, so Okay, n1 equals 100. Wait, we need the bigger. So it's gonna be n2. They have to do everything reverse, don't they? Uh, y bar two equals two, three, eight, four, five, eight, one, five. S two equals o two, five, two, five. Oh my gosh, I wanna solve this quickly here. So n1 is equal to 69. Uh, y bar two equals three, three, Bar one. Here we go. Um, S one equals one four four six five nine five nine, and then the T. So Q T. I always get these reversed. Um, probability twenty nine with degrees of freedom. What does it want? What percent confidence? Ninety eight percent confidence. One one three point nine one. Right. That is right. Okay, so that'll be T score. And so now we have it. So now we go over here and we get the difference, which is the estimate of the difference, which is Y bar one minus Y bar two. There's the difference. And then the standard error is equal to square root of so much. I could turn this into a thing where you solve it, turn it into an online shiny app. Uh, S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. There we go. And then the standard or the margin of error equals to the T score times the uh, standard error. And then the diff plus the margin of error there really oh okay and then let's round it to one des zero decimals close it off and then that's lower probably concatenate and then do the minus over here whoa that's a 
big wait. Yeah, that's right. Hey, what's up, Meredith? Let's see if I got it right. 146,000. That is much bigger. I'm worried. Square root. What is the standard error equal to this time? The standard error this time is 20,000. Did I do it wrong? I think I did something wrong last... Bit. Do you know what I didn't do last time? Who knows what I didn't do? I think I know what I didn't do previously because I thought it was weird. You know what I didn't do? I didn't square the standard deviations. So actually, last time I did it, I did it wrong. This question is just a very, very mathy problem. No, we can't ban it. This, this looks to be that I did it correctly this time, but I didn't square. If you were watching it previously, I didn't square my standard deviations. So I'm pretty sure I got it wrong last time because I was like, the standard error looked kind of small because um, I've done, nah, it's, it's, you gotta, you gotta be as careful as Brian here. So you gotta make sure to square your standard deviations because I thought something looked weird. That value right there was wrong. Um, it should have been, we should have squared the standard deviations. So be very careful. Um, you can make errors with your calculations. It happens all the time. Um, check answer. There we go. So if you see the steps right here, I did it in R because it's a lot easier to put in the numbers. Um, you need to be very careful. And this is where I made the error last time I didn't square the standard deviations. So what does this question all boil down to? What is this question all? So here's the answer. This is how to solve this question. I got this, I got the plus or minus wrong. This question all boils down to knowing your what? This question all boils down to knowing your what? What does this question boil down to? All notation. It's all notation. It's all plugging into the formula. Really good practice, not making an error. And if you don't make an error and you solve it out correctly, you will get the right answer. Also, you need to know to go to the T applet and get the correct T value. Notation, brother. Notation, brother. So make sure to know the notation for this. Really good thing. And then they give you an interpretation. I am 98% confident that... Da -da 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 -da. Uh, that's on average more than we're saying how much more the waterfront is worth more, right? We are 98% common to the waterfront property is worth on average blank to blank more. So we just need to take our values right here. Really? I can't copy my own values. So the true difference is somewhere in this interval, the true difference. No, no, no. Um, I think that's right. As long as I copied the values correctly. Yeah. That's a really good question. Uh, pretty tricky. And what do we have right here? The next question boils down to what, what does the next question boil down to once again, this one is once again, and we'll mark it here in a second, a simply a what problem, what kind of problem is this question going to be right here? You know it, you love it. It's all notation. So let's see right here. Let's put a note on the work for 59.35, stat 201, chapter 17 quiz, researchers investigated. Okay, so researchers investigated drinking size to figure out how much soda people tend to put in them. People were given a 17 ounce and a 25 ounce. So there's the 25 and there's 17 and were invited to pour as much soda as they liked. Did the glass size change the portion size? Did it change? So what are they telling you right here? Did it change the portion size? What are they telling you right there? And I'm trying to think which way they do this. So that's going to be all of my notes be zero. So that's going to be small minus large. Did it change the portion size? What are they telling you? They've just told us the what there. Did it change the portion size? What did they just tell us? Does not equals, great job right there. They told us the does not equals because they're asking, is there a difference between, so they told us the sign of the alternative right there. The summaries are shown to the right. Assume any assumptions are satisfied, random 10%. Uh, nearly normal and independent groups. And we'll talk about those today in class. 
So with this, let's take a look at get the question. We need to do y bar one minus y bar two over, and I think we're doing small, large minus small, small minus large. So y bar small minus y bar large over square root, uh, the standard deviation squared of small over the sample size of small and plus the standard deviation squared of large over the sample size of large equals a T with degrees of freedom. Okay. So now let's go ahead and plug in our numbers right here. We're just going to start highlighting the small goes right here. I'm going to double check that the difference should be negative because we are going to get a negative difference. Do they say which way to subtract the means? And the mean of the smaller glass is this. The null hypothesis is the same. Uh, that is where is the small glass. Okay, they're doing mu1 is the small glass. Good, we set it up correctly. Mu1 is the small glass equals zero. Um, and then this is their different. And this is does not equal. Make sure mu1 is the small glass and mu2 is the large glass which we set up over here in our question where we have the first mean minus the second mean. That's where we have mu1 minus mu2. So that is the way we're setting it up and we're good to go on that. So now find the T statistic, which we are currently finding right here, which we've set up. And once again, you have to make sure you set this up properly with all the notation, make sure to square those. And we're just highlighting right now all the notation so we know what goes where and you can follow through with this problem and identify, oh, it's 23 for both sample sizes, yay. Does it say that they took samples of 23? Be careful, your question may be different from mine, but both of these are 23, says The Rock would say. It doesn't matter. They're both gonna be 23. So now let's go ahead and plug in the numbers right here. We don't have crazy numbers this time. 5.29 minus 6.52 over square root and the standard deviation of 1.84 squared, squared over 23 plus 2.99 squared over 23 is the standardized difference. Uh, minus different ends, yeah, make sure then you have the correct ends right there uh, related to the right sample sizes. So here we'll do the following, just so I lucked out it looks like. Um, so Rhea, just so other people can follow along, that would be the right one there. So if you're following along with the color coding, notice how all of this right here is all related to the large. So notice all those numbers right there are related to the large numbers. Just make sure to do the correct notation. It should work out. Uh, be very careful. Like it's easy to make a mistake on notation like 2.91 squared, I forgot to square them last time, over 23, there's that. 1.84 squared over 23 plus the other quantity square root. Okay, one seven, that's the standard error. And then the difference up top is 6.5, 5.29 minus 6.52, it's negative one, two, three. And that is equal to the T statistic of something like 1.5-ish. Negative, yeah, negative 7.1.9. Negative 1.713. Okay, so there is the T. Does that make sense for you right there? There is the T statistic we found right there. That is the T. So we're going to take that T and go back here and put in the T to three decimals. Good job. And so that should be correct. T to three decimals. Good job. And now it wants us to find the P value. Now this is where you're gonna to have to go and use the T applet. We can take a guess at it though. It says to four decimals, so this is a very hard guess. This is a very, very tough guess. I'm not gonna get it. Four decimals? No, okay. So to get the T statistic, we have to know the right T. How do we know the right T to use? How do we know the right T to use? We're gonna to have to find what first? To know the T, we have to first know the t's what? Well, so we have to know the sign. So we're gonna be doing the does not equals test, the two-tailed test. And we also have to get the what to use the t. The what's for this t. We have to know this t's specific what's. We need to know the what for this t. 
Anytime you're using a T, you have to make sure you have the T with the right amount of what? It's degrees of freedom. So the sample sizes were 23, 23, and then also we had standard deviations of 1.84 and 2.91. 1.84, 2.91. There we go. The degrees of freedom are here. So now we take the degrees of freedom. We go back to the T and we input the degrees of freedom. Then we take our T score right here and we go to the T statistic and we plot the outside. Wow, I was way off, darn it, 0.096. Now this one does not give to three decimals or to four decimals. So if you were to get this wrong right here, please let me know. I'm gonna see if it lets me get it correct and then I'll show you. So it is mad. If you get this wrong right here because of that, let me know. There is an applet that I'm gonna use here that will give it to four decimals. I hit the wrong button. So the applet I'm gonna use, and I'll drop this in the chat, because they're being so specific. Um, okay, so here is the applet to use. Uh, that I don't know if that will. This applet will give the right answer right here. It's just not as pretty. Um, so we have to go put in our degrees of freedom. I've dropped in the chat. So here's the degrees of freedom. It doesn't even say DF right there. And then we need our T statistic right here. And then we go to the outside of it right there. So this one is more exact. It's saying 0.09, um, you see, there it is right there. If you, if your p-value on this one is slightly off, just let me know. It should like this. I hate that they say four decimals, 0.09. And actually that rounds, does it? Let me look at it again. It does round to five. That should like it. There we go. Um, I wish I had seen, let me go look at the plus or minus on that. We'll, we'll finish this question off right here and then we'll look at the plus or minus on it. Um, yeah, so this is the exact according to a applet that does more finite calculations. Um, like we were able to put more decimals in and we're able to put all the degrees of freedom decimals. Um, yeah, so let me know if that question tells you you're wrong. I will give you your points back, but you have to be within very close to it. So make sure you're very close and I will give you the points back. Sorry, that one, a little too exact on it. And I don't like this, the way this one visualizes. I think this visualizes better. This one's a little more mathy and a little more confusing to use. That's why I don't love it as much. So with this right here, we should get to the last part, which is not too difficult. So if we are using the alpha of 0.05, do you reject or don't reject your null? What do you do right here? If you get to the last part here, right here, do you reject or not reject your null? What would you do, reject or not reject? What would you do, reject or not reject? Look at your p-value and reject or not reject. Fail to reject, not reject, so fail to reject. So the data gives evidence for the alternative or does not give evidence for the alternative? So the data gives evidence for the alternative or does not give evidence for the alternative? Oh, we see right here. So if we do not reject, it does not provide evidence for the alternative that there is a difference. And I am interested in the plus or minus margin of error on that. So let's see. Let me. I'm going to redo the question here real quick. I want to see the margin of error on it. Um, how much leeway it has. So it is the same with equals and difference and not equals. Check. Enter the T, it is a negative difference. It looks similar to our last one, but a little bit smaller. So something like that. And then it even shows the equation. Be cool if I got this. Oh, Nate, one point, oh, it's positive difference this time. Positive? Positive difference? Well, maybe they allow the T to be positive or negative. Oh, look at the tolerance on that. I gotta make sure I calculate it correctly. And so the p-value right here, well, I shouldn't get it right. The p-value is this time gonna be closer to five-ish percent, somewhere around there, but it's, we'll try, no, it's not gonna be four. We'll try 6%, which is close-ish to it, but I don't wanna get it right. I wanna see the tolerance. Really, I there's no plus or minus on this. There's a plus or minus, right? 0.003. 0.003, I wish they gave more tolerance on that, um, but I was close to 6%. So we do not reject, there is, do not provide evidence for a difference. So even if, you can get part of that question right, but I highly suggest 
understanding this question. Oh, you get 0.78 points out of one for just understanding the notation and getting the T and the P value wrong. Um, so, but do tell me if you get the P value wrong. Today should be last day class in Wednesday's review. Um, well, no, we good. To, we will be reviewing. Brian, is there still another chapter? Yes, chi squared. Chi squared. Awesome job. Yeah, we gotta send the email to the class. Thank you so much, Blake, right there. Let's go do that right here. I'll play my favorite song right here. All right, let's send the email to class. Say class starting soon. Class in nine minutes. Oh no, people don't show up. My hair got so long over the course of the semester. Wait, wait, what? It like brought me to the wrong spot. Okay, that's my best. Class in eight minutes. Class in eight minutes. See you soon. Click here. Okay, until then. Let me get the timer going here. Eight, three, start class in eight minutes. I didn't even send the announcement. Until then, bye for now, everyone. You got this, Evan. We will do the chi squared. Chi squared coming up. Bye.